wonderful memories. What are you insinuating? Who would do something like this, Mr. Mendoza? This is where I played the character of a lawyer who murdered someone. In the play Four Horse Road, the entire play was based on real-life incidents in Waterloo Street. So, just like Four Horse Road, I want to make my own play. And I'm inspired by real-life stories and history, in particular, Brass Pasta and Bogus. Why here? Because it has so many stories, illicit and seedy stories, as well as very wholesome stories. And it's filled with all kinds of colourful characters. So much to work with. I love it. <laughs> Dwayne here. I'm a playwright, storyteller, and performer. To be or not to be, that is the question. Stories are the backbone of my work, and real life offers up the best inspiration. I'm exploring the streets of Brass Pasa and Boogies. Sourcing material for a new play from obscure nuggets hidden in history. Stories of crime, yeah, Mom. punishment, and yet peace. The streets have been the backdrop where lives have been saved, and in another era, of lives unabashedly on display, on the hunt to uncover the invisible faces behind secret details hidden in buildings and behind landmarks and streets. Like this bridge. And this road. But where's the beach? I'm looking for the good. Hi, Fabian. The bad. And the ugly. Inspiration for my new performance piece, sparked by the lesser-known histories of these streets. <laughs> I'm with fellow performer Xiao Ting, reminiscing about our days acting in the play Four Horse Road back in 2020. Although it's kind of cool to imagine that this actually came from an actual mural, or, or rather a painting. Oh no, it was like a street art right, right. back in the day. So they didn't just come up with it, right? Oh, so they referred to something that was actual. A reminder that history is the perfect place to mine for material for my new play. <laughs> and I'm starting with a role that kick-started it all. So after playing a murderer, in the Brass Pasa Bugis area, I, I was thinking, what are some of the actual crime stories that took place here? So, if you try to Google crime plus Brass Pasa plus Bugis, you will be surprised at the number of hits that you get. So these are some of the articles that I found online. <laughs> there are a lot. Wow, I can't imagine, like, I mean, the boogies now and the boogies then is completely different. Now it's just full of shops and cafes and last time, wow, it was really full of crime, man. But one story from 1978 catches my eye. It's not the most conventional crime, but plays out like a scene from the movie Speed with a young Keanu Reeves. 15-year-old bus crash suspect sent to mental hospital. Where exactly did he crash into? Time to put my thinking cap on. The 15-year-old boy stole an SBS bus from the Topayo depot, took it for a joyride, and crashed headfirst into the wall of the Catholic Young Men's Association, or CYMA building as it was known back then. Thankfully, it was all superficial damage and no one was hurt. These are the streets of 1978. The bus was travelling from Benkulin Street into Bras Pasa Road and crashed into the CYMA building. And that spot is right here. So this is the exact location where the bus crashed into the building at that very junction. And if you look at that tiny tree over here, chances are over the years he has grown up to be that big tree over there. 
the CYMA building has since been demolished, and now it's the SMU School of Computing and Information Systems. But it isn't the only building that once stood here. The remains of an old prison were buried here too, and excavated during the construction of SMU. So those bricks that were dug up while building SMU, they are right here on display at the National Museum. I'm going to have a chat with senior curator Daniel, who's going to tell us a little bit more about them. These were the exact bricks that, uh, that we found uh, at Bras Basa, mm -hmm. which is just, in fact, opposite where we are at the museum. And that was the location of the Bras Basa jail, mm. which, the, with, which the Indian convict labourers uh, helped to, to build. So, wait, you're telling me that the Indian convicts built their own jail? In the early 1800s, Singapore was a penal colony for the Strait Settlement. What the British East India Company referred to as Penang, Malacca and Singapore. The first batch of 80 convicts arrived from India in 1825. And over the years, their numbers grew and a decision was made in 1841 to build a prison to house them. It's like the inside of the Istana. <laughs> exactly. Actually, speaking of the Istana, that was built by the, the convict labourers oh, as well. Wow, I didn't know that. And, and this is an image that you can see here of the Istana being built. Right. Uh, now, of course, you only see the finished product, but yeah. Yeah, and now I can hold on to the brick that built the Istana. <laughs> yeah. Well, a similar brick. Similar brick, yeah, similar brick. That's right. The convicts were, uh, were trained to uh, build their own bricks. Mm. And they actually got pretty good at it and won some prizes even for, for the quality of their brick making. Guys, this mm. is an award-winning brick, okay? It's actually won prizes for their quality. I mean, wow, so Singapore is built on some good quality bricks, man. Solid, it's a solid yeah. foundation, yeah. <laughs> Today, we see the SMU campus grounds. But 160 years ago, this lush green space was a jail. What was it like? This book, Prisoners, Their Own Waters, was written by Major J.F.A. McNair in 1899. He was the superintendent of convicts. So this is the blueprint of the jail, and uh, over here we have the cook rooms. Uh, here is oh, there's a there's a convict hospital over here, and uh, this is probably like a, it's a courtyard area or something. And at these grounds, a harrowing incident played out in 1875. So. This is where the most dramatic and daring prison escape took place, right here outside the SMU School of Computing and Information Systems. So the drama began at 5 p.m. while the prisoners were having their dinner. I can see it all happening now. The first violent act. The prisoner stabs the water from behind with a pointed instrument. Another prisoner aims for his head with a hatchet, but misses. At this point, the superintendent rushes in, but he's also stabbed. So at this point, the prisoners shout a signal. 60 prisoners start charging towards the prison wardens. Now, imagine being a prison warden and all you have to defend for yourself are umbrellas and walking sticks. But in front of you, you have pirates, murderers and robbers using weapons and charging at you! The prisoners escape from the central enclosure easily and into the workyard. Over here, the prisoners are climbing over the workyard fence with a ladder to get to the prison yard and to the main gate. Some of the prisoners have already escaped and are running through the grounds of the Cathedral of the Good Shepherd over there. Back at the gate, the wife of a prison warder secures the gate from the outside 
and defends it with a long sword, slashing at anyone who tries to escape. Things were getting out of control. Orders were shoot to kill the escaping prisoners. In total, there were 27 deaths, including the superintendent. 19 prisoners were killed, and nine more prisoners were executed after that. This was the incident that basically led to the closing down of this prison. It turns out the convicts didn't just make bricks and buildings. In this artisan prison village, there were shops for tailors, weavers, rattan workers, coir and rope makers, flag makers, a printing press, and photo studio. Oh, check this out. All convicts had their likeness taken and were registered for identification in case of escape. So they basically were taking photos of themselves so that they could be identified because, because um, the identity by means of fingerprints was approved later. You know, this photography studio became a functioning photography studio that people could actually visit the jail to take photos of themselves. Even the commonplace rattan chair finds its origins with the convicts. The rattan chairs that the Chinese now sell so widely were invented in the jail. And their crafts were held in high regard. These figures tabulate the value of the items they made. That the value of bricks here was 26,683. If you look at the value of rattan work, is. 915. But when you compare it to the average blue-collar worker, they only earn, what, five, five rupees. So it just goes to show the quality of their work. It was really, really good. Award-winning bricks, hugely popular rattan chairs, a photography studio open to the public. I wonder if the prisoners' good work within the prison walls ever translated to respect. Or was it once a prisoner, always a prisoner? Okay, so one thing that really struck me was that SMU used to be the Brass Pasta Jail. So I was thinking maybe I can use the jail as a setup for my show. Now that I've got my premise for my new show, I need my sets. And there's a myth surrounding a mysterious plasterwork made by the convicts that I want to explore. You know how every group of friends has the entertainer? The one who makes you smile? That's always been me. Front stage and front row. I was born for the stage. I've been an elephant, this dude, and Jesus. I'm a playwright and performer, and now looking for inspiration to create a new play set in Brass Pasa and Bogus. I'm looking for the stories behind the stories. Obscure places and people that I don't know about. Uh, what, what? I've learned about the Brass Pasa Jail, the site of a dramatic prison riot and escape, and the thriving artisan village within its walls. The prisoner brickmakers, stonemasons, and roof slaters all had a part in building many Singapore iconic landmarks and monuments. This courthouse and this bridge, these streets, this road, and this cathedral. Situated at the edge of Brass Basa, the St. Andrew's Cathedral with its English Gothic facade was built under the Public Works Department in 1856 an ambitious project it took them eight years to complete. So after finding out about the landmarks that were built by the convicts, Daniel invited me over again because he wants to show me a painting. He wants to show me some obscure details about this painting that many people may have otherwise missed out on. This painting by John Turnbull Thompson. Yep, the same guy Thompson wrote was named after. His day job, a surveyor and superintendent of public works in Singapore. His side hobby, paintings of the very buildings he was responsible for. 
this was a painting that was done in 1851. So mm -hmm. it gives you a really nice, uh, I would say, snapshot of what yeah. Singapore looked like in the middle of the 19th century. And this is at the Padang, basically. So, so what is this building over here? Ah, uh, this, this small building that you see over here mm -hmm. that is the Armenian church. Uh, oh, it's, it's one okay. of the, the buildings in this painting that still survives to today. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. And then this would be... Mm. This would be the, the Church of St. Andrews. Doesn't quite look like the cathedral. Yeah, yeah, it looks very different. Way. Yeah, correct. Exactly. This this was the the building done before, before. Uh, the, the cathedral that we that we know of today. Um, they they started off without a spire. Okay. Uh, like that. So if you can just imagine. So nothing um, like that. It looks yeah. almost like the White House. That, exactly. Right. So some okay. some people weren't very happy uh, about oh. it. They say hey, this doesn't really look like a church. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's add a spire to it. Right. Um, they added the spire, but it ended up being structurally not very sound. Mm -hmm. um, it got struck by lightning as well. No way! Uh, so they decided, okay, you know, maybe let's let's tear this down and, and rebuild it. So they rebuild it. So this was like That's almost right. like the before. Fast forward to 1856. It shows the old Teluk Aya Street right by the coast. And all this area would later be reclaimed to form our CBD. This view of Singapore is almost unrecognisable. Okay, let me try to find mm. uh, the cathedral. It's there, right? It's there. It's there somewhere. Is this one? Yeah. Ah? Eh? No, uh, it's this one. No, it's this one. It's yes, so yes, bad. Yes, yes, it's, yes, like fine. One. it's like, where's Wally? Yeah. <laughs> just, no, and, and this is a really fun painting to do something like that. Yeah. yeah. This this is uh, a building that's still around today. Okay. Um, it's uh, what what is known as the art house right now. Oh, uh, right. At, okay. at that time, it was the courthouse. Uh, mm. Before it was renovated, so it's not very recognisable anymore. Okay, okay. Uh, but you're right, this is the cathedral. But there's no spire, right? Yeah, that's right. It's not been built yet. Oh. So, so this is fantastic. I mean, we were talking about a time lapse. I think this is the, the, the closest that the we The middle get. one, right? Yeah, I mean, we have lots of final images of the cathedral. Yes, yes, yes. But, yes, but this is quite precious because it shows the uh, cathedral while it was being built. Being built, yeah. right. Oh, the only thing we're lacking is being able to zoom in. Huh? Yeah, yeah, zoom? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it actually not bad. If you if you go really up close, you do see some interesting. So I just met Daniel and he showed me the paintings of St. Andrew's Cathedral before and during construction. Now it got me thinking: how was it built? What kind of materials was used? Was there anything special in its design? Let's find out. In Major J.F.A. McNair's book, Prisoners, Their Own Waters, he writes, In dealing with the interior walls and columns, we used what is well known, though little employed with us in England, Madras tuna. It turns out it's a form of plaster work that has an intriguing ingredient list that at times resembles a baking recipe. And it's a process that takes three coats and a really, really long time. The plaster is composed of one part chunam, taken from the Tamil word chunampu, or burnt lime, and one and a half of river sand thoroughly mixed and well beaten up with water. Mix with jaggery water, to a proper consistency. It is then laid on about an inch thick. With my block of Madras Chunam, I've got to compare it to the real deal. St. Andrews is undergoing a massive multi-year restoration project. No pesky playwrights are allowed in. So I can only look in from the outside but I've got the next best option. Enter Kang Shua, conservation guru involved in the cathedral's restoration works for the past decade. So Kang Shua, I've finally done my own version of the Madras Trinam. Yes. Okay. Wow. Wait, what does that mean? What does the wow mean? <laughs> It looks like tofu. <laughs> so uh, while well, looking at the recipe, it really almost sounds like it's a cooking recipe. Yeah, I mean, there's eggs and there's sugar yeah. and there's like... Uh, sour curd. Yeah, sour curd. Uh, yeah. Oil. Everything, I yes. mean, I, I, I didn't try to eat it, but... <laughs> I don't think it's edible at all. Uh, is it accurate? Is it... 
Well, well, let me take a look at okay, it. Okay. So, so this is the first time looking at <laughs> someone making Mother Chunam. Uh, no building experience. No building experience. Okay. Well, you can see from cross section, yep. the first coat, uh, which is supposed to have a lot of sand, yet there isn't much of sand because probably you have a lot of lime mm, in mm. the first coat. Mm, right? Okay. And uh, I, I suppose that if you follow the recipe, there should be less sand on the final coat than okay. the first coat. Okay. So I, I'm not too sure what's what went wrong. Maybe I didn't put uh, baking soda, is it? <laughs> but uh, I can still smell egg white here. From... <laughs> Looks like Kang Shua isn't impressed with my plaster work. Tell you what is so special about Maja Chunam, it's not really about first coat and second coat. It's actually the last coat where there's a lot of polishing going on, right? Okay. So when you polish it, it can give you a very smooth and yeah. even sometimes mirrory uh, finish. Right, okay. And, and that's actually to, uh, to mimic marble, white marble. In their restoration work, Kang Shua has done plaster examinations on the walls of the cathedral to determine what was used. They found evidence of lime plaster, Portland cement, and even the original bricks within the columns, still in pristine condition. But so far, no traces of Madras Chunam have been found. McNair's account clearly states that they used Madras Chunam in the building. So why can't we find any? And in terms of costing, because to get yes. so many eggs, right, it's yes. going to be quite expensive, right? <laughs> yes, I would, I would think so. I, right now, even so, right, with yeah. this uh, recently, our egg prices yes, are Yes, they are very expensive <laughs> to make this slab of yes, Madras yes. Chunam. So how much do it cost you to make this, you know? A, a lot of eggs, lah. <laughs> <laughs> but because I'm thinking like, um, I mean, the convicts were the one that, that yes. built, so labour would be cheap. Yes. And that would be in contrast with the cost of Madras Chunam. Yes, that's right. right. So chances are maybe it really wasn't... Yes, if we look at historical records, there's a record that uh, the governor of Singapore, the mm -hmm. Shukri, actually wrote uh, that there isn't sufficient budget. Mm. The budget approved is too little. With a strapped construction budget and the sky-high price of eggs in the 1800s, Kang Shua's theory is that perhaps Madras Chunam never graced these walls. Or it might have been there before, but was removed and painted over, lost to time. Without digging up all the walls of the entire cathedral, we might never know. After chatting with Kang Shua, we still can't conclude if Madras Chunam was actually used in the construction of the cathedral. You know what? I don't think it really matters. Because sometimes it's really nice to have a little mystery to life. Don't you think so? For my new play, I've got my backdrops. Now I need my characters. And one seemingly insignificant person from history is going to take my breath away. I'm an actor and writer, on the hunt for material for a new play set in the Bras Pasa and Bugis area. One discovery has led me to another, and I'm imagining the setting inspired by history. An old colonial jail with prisoners, artisans and craftsmen building physical structures, and metaphorically rebuilding their lives. But who are these faceless characters? That's where this historical Sherlock Holmes comes in. I wow. have a map. Oh my god, wow. Buried okay. deep in the archives, she found the story of one convict. When this name mystery came up, it was very fascinating because the archives are a record of day-to-day -day government affairs. Right. And they don't usually mention people by name. Mm. And here we have a convict who's at the lowest rung of the social order, mm -hmm. and yet his name is mentioned not once but multiple times. I had transcribed quite a few pages with his name in it, but it didn't register in my head that this is the same name because the spellings were all different. In Hindi, when I read it out... Uh. Wow. It's Konak mystery. So it, they almost sound the same. Mm. And it was a, like a light bulb moment when it went off. And I said, oh my God, I'm, we are talking at the same person. We start building a timeline of mystery's life. And it begins as a dresser in the Popper's Hospital. 1828, 
and his salary has now increased from rupees 10 to rupees 12. So if you compare it to Mohan the barber, you can see that Kunuk Misri is now getting quite a princely sum what he's doing. Yes. And Kunuk Misri goes and buys a piece of land in Chinatown in 1842. Okay. Right. So he could have bought this land to rent it out and earn extra money. Which is again surprising considering he was a convict. So this man, this man was really very business savvy. He was business yeah. savvy. for a municipal notification okay. for the election of municipal commissioners for the year 1857. Okay. And all these are names of people who are eligible to stand for election as well as vote in the election. I mean, from, yeah. from here... Yeah, correct. From here to being a convict, a yeah. dresser, to a person who can now stand for election as a municipal commissioner. At this time, we see a difference in his attitude now, or at least we have records for that. Yes. He decides to give back to Singapore. He has donated land for religious purposes. And Mystery gets a first page mention in the Government Gazette for his philanthropy. And then we have Gunuk Mystery, okay? He he donated for a bathing, bathing place. place. 1,100. So the wow. amount may seem small, yeah. but his name is mentioned on the same page as Tan Kim Seng, yeah. who is one of the major philanthropists, which shows how much respectability he had gained. And finally, in 1865, in the Singapore Free Press, a death notice of Kanaka Maestri, a liberated convict of considerable wealth. He leaves his assets of $50,000 to his sons. And you can imagine 150 years ago how much money that was. Mm. And what? And he was important, again important enough to be mentioned in the press because he had certain social standing. For me, what, was, what stood out was at the end of it, he still labelled the convict. Isn't that no, sad? That's why I said. Beyond the archives, what traces of Mystery's life are left in our world? This question takes us to Carpenter Street. He's not going in. What he's doing? OK, let's go. So we are standing on the piece of land where Kunuk Mystery stood 180 years We're standing ago. on history. <laughs> yes, we are, we are. So this piece of land was mm -hmm. leased for the first time for 99 years in the year 1842. He was the first owner of this piece of land. A friend of mine who understands maps from that time actually told me that this could be the area where Kunuk Mystery actually bought land. 15 Carpenter Street is what he says. Wow. Yeah. He might have just walked this yes. exact path before and we're walking on history. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. yeah. After spending time with Vendana and finding all about Gunok Mystery's story, I'm really inspired because he's someone that didn't allow himself to be defined by his past. Now I'm going to find out more about the Bras Pasar Bugis area and see what else inspires me. So, I have this map of Singapore in the 1800s and I'm looking at the Brass Pasar area and over here I see the small word, hospital. And it got me thinking, you know, hospitals are usually associated with death and sicknesses. But then I was also thinking, hospitals are a place of healing, a place where life-saving treatments are given. And this was necessary because in Singapore in the 1800s, life wasn't very easy then. Then I was thinking, Mystery worked as a dresser in the hospital. Could it be this hospital, Singapore's oldest, SGH? I'm at the SGH Museum, full of facts and artefacts from its 200-year history. Here to meet Jin, the unofficial historian who helped put this all together. 
And I was right. This was the origins of the Singapore General Hospital, but a very different SGH to what we know now. The facility was just a modest setup in the form of the wooden shed. So they were at the mercy of the weather, the rain and the conditions. That's why they had to shift. In colonial times, mm. the so-called earliest nurses mm -hmm. were actually, yeah, you are right, male convicts. Wow. They were sent to the hospital. Mm -hmm. They were working like orderlies, dressers, compounders. But they were in chains. Yeah. <laughs> So the clanking of the chains yes. was very unnerving for the patients. Correct. I can imagine you're trying to rest and then you hear clang, clang, clang. <laughs> so the convict jail is just beside the hospital in 1827. That's probably why a lot of the convicts went over to work as dressers, you know, as, as orderlies. And then eventually they moved over here and Fun fact, right, this building, this museum, is the exact um, building that was here from, from 1926. Yeah, so we're standing on a piece of history. What an apt place to be a museum, right? <laughs> After meeting with Ms Jin, I realised that the hospital was nowhere near the building that you see now at Utrum. In fact, it was nowhere near a building. It was a wooden shed in Braspasa. Now, this is the story behind Singapore General Hospital's humble beginnings. 1821, the first wooden shed on Braspasa Road. At mercy to the weather, it doesn't last. So, it's replaced in 1822, but starts falling apart very soon. 1828, a new one is built with every regard to economy. Basically, keep it cheap. So within two years, it's dilapidated, full of holes and impossible to stay in when it rains. Eventually, the Singapore General Hospital moves to Pearls Hill, ending its time in the Bras Basa area. All this is sparking ideas for the play. So in terms of characters, I think I want to focus on Gunuk Mystery. The mystery of Gunuk Mystery. But I need more characters. And something I saw in the museum keeps coming back to mind. Sisters from the French convent? <laughs> Stories are my life's work as a performer and playwright. I'm seeking inspiration for a new play about the Bras Basa and Bugis area. I'm now crafting the heart of every story, its characters. A letter from 1885 mentions the hospital's first official nurses, nuns from the French convent. And this local French convent, it's familiar to many of us. So Chimes is a place where people hang out for live music. There are restaurants, cafes and bars. Well, I did some research and I found out the origins of the convent. And with any exciting story, there's always a very dramatic beginning. Here goes. On 6th December 1851, five chosen young women boarded a large sailing vessel for the dangerous sea voyage was to take more than four months. Three weeks after setting sail, one sister, who was in charge of the group, fell ill and died. She was buried at sea. Then during a bad storm, a pulley fell on another sister's head. She suffered a brain fever for the rest of her life. They finally arrived in Singapore, and another sister, the only one who spoke English, announced that she was leaving the group. She had fallen in love with the captain. So reinforcements were sent from France, with Sister Matil, who is considered the founder of the IJ mission in Singapore. And the sisters arrived in Singapore on 2nd February 1854 and they moved in here. 
These characters are brewing in my head, and a set designed like chimes would be the perfect backdrop for their scenes. But what obscure details can I incorporate into the set design, like Easter eggs? Here's Fabian, tour guide extraordinaire whose brain holds more effects than you can shake a stick at. So this is where it all started in 1854. Oh. And then after that, um, as Singapore's population grew, there was a need for more space to house all this increasing number of students. Wow. And here are two things I absolutely can't miss in designing my set. And what about this? Like, this is the... Yeah, so that's an interesting feature. One possible uh, reason, it could be a reference mm. to the rose window. So a rose window is oh, yeah. a typical uh, neo-Gothic architecture um, okay. feature that you will find in churches. This is where the abandoned babies were left by their families. People will be leaving their babies here, man. Yeah, correct. So it, you can imagine, you know, in, behind this wall, yeah. the families would just leave their babies outside yeah. crying. They'll probably knock on the door, yeah. and a, a nun or a sister will come, will come by, you know. So they'll come here, check. So this is probably where the peephole is, where the nuns would look out to see who is outside the door. So they'll look out from here. Oh, hey, Fabian. Can you see me? <laughs> or if they needed to write a letter, they'll just slip it through the hole over here. You look in this staircase, right? Yeah. You look in the middle, right? Between the steps. There's oh. this interesting symbol that you might recognise. Oh my gosh. And you will see a crescent and the star. Yeah, how cool is that? Cool. And it's on every step. Yep, all the way to the top. So this is actually um, the symbol of the Islamic faith, yes, yes, right? Yes, so yes, you'll yes, be yes. curious to know as to, as to why is there this symbol in the yeah. Catholic yeah. convent, right? <laughs> so um, actually the sisters were very practical. Donations from Muslims. Mm. So they actually donated some as well. There was already this uh, uh, religious tolerance okay. practice, you know, by everyone in, you know, in Singapore. It's like paying homage to yeah, them. It's exactly. like almost like correct. being grateful, yeah, like we're really grateful for this. Oh, yeah. wow. Out exploring on my own, I find some other gems too. So this is one of the lesser known details that Fabian was talking about. I mean, if you look closely, you'd see a Buddha head over there, right in the middle of the fan light window. Well, it's to pay homage to some of the religious groups that contributed to the convent and the orphanage. And I get special access to a room called the Alcove that's only open to private rentals. This is where the nuns would gather and do their work. Marché en ma présent et soy parfait. Hmm, I wonder what this means. So now I think it's a restaurant and a dessert. But let's Google translate this phrase and see what it means. Walk in my presence and be perfect. What an apt hype phrase for the nuns and who are working here. It's really cheering them on with this phrase. Fun fact, did you know that Town Convent was actually home to several boys as well? Yeah. In the 1910s to the 30s, several boys were also from the convent. One of them was the famous David Marshall. Yes, you probably remember him from your history textbooks. He was Singapore's first chief minister. And then there was American mystery writer Leslie Charteris, while he created the Simon Templar character in the film The Saints. I remember that movie. But what did this convent look like in the past? So I'm here at CHIJ, Our Lady Queen of Peace, and Sister Maria has graciously dug out all these photos from the past for me to look through, see what life was like back then. Okay. Wow. Look at all this. All the sisters with all the different children. These are probably the tiger cups, right? Hmm, let's see what else. I recognize these pillars and these arcways. Oh, they are doing the needlework. All of them have a little a little cloth and needles and a little basket of stuff. And 
Aha, my favorite time of the day, lunchtime. Oh, they all look so interested in their food. This looks like a little conveyor belt. Everybody just mixed. These are all the girls who have grown up, and some of them even have their own children now. Wow. You know, looking at all these photos, I think I'm... I mean, it inspires me to, to think about how I can incorporate them into the show that I'm writing, you know. It could be very nice if I have these as backdrop, as multimedia moments, or, or maybe even zero in on some of the stories that could have happened during that time. I found the absolute goodness of humans in Town Convent in Braspasa. But the writer in me can't help but feel like my story needs a bit of edge. You take one. So I've been involved in several productions that featured Boogie Street in the 1970s and its CD reputation. So I've done a lot of research in this area. But today I discovered this blog post and I found out that there were several foreign films that actually filmed in Boogie Street. So this was Boogie Street at midnight. Oh my, so it looked like that in the past. Wow. Wow, look at the wigs and the makeup. Okay, so Transfer Nights at Boogie Street from the film Pretty Polly, 1967. And other movie scenes were even inspired by real life incidents. Oh, what is this? Oh my goodness. <laughs> The infamous flat roof toilet, okay, so sailors from Australia performed the ritualistic, okay, it's called Dance of the Flaming <laughs> Don't know if I can say it on TV, but it says here in the newspapers, with newspaper or toilet paper stuffed up. Oh my gosh, okay, this beep. <laughs> I wonder if the toilet is still there. And I think what might be fun is if I print all these panoramas from the film, from this blog post, and I make my way down to Bogus Junction and see if I can identify and match these places, the exact places. Bogus Street today is a lot more sanitized than its colorful past. The old Bogus Street is now Bogus Junction, and Bogus Street Market is built up over once iconic places. But these time capsules have been preserved on celluloid films. So this panorama is from the film Pretty Polly in 1967. Well, if you look at the panorama, the street stretched out all the way to here. But now it's just changed into this semicircle building that you see over here. So this stretch over here would be where the impromptu cabaret would take place along Booger Street. Transvestites dressed in beautiful gowns and dresses and big hair and beautiful makeup will be parading and strutting their stuff down the street. Something like this. Once upon a time, before this fountain was here, this place was jam-packed with tables and diners, just having a great time underneath the stars, eating and drinking and chatting with one another. Oh, I can imagine what a festive place this area was. Wow. This film, St. Jack, in 1979, was banned in Singapore for 30 years because of its risque content. The main character, Jack Flowers, is taking his friend down from Victoria Street heading towards Malabar Street, where all the food places were. You know what? I think we have the same fashion sense. I'm sure I fit in really well during that time. <laughs> and here we are at the site of the infamous toilet that was featured in the film Boogie Street. Now, the film was based on a real-life situation where two Australian sailors stood on top of that toilet and were dancing around with their bare bottoms showing. Now, this place is just tucked away in an alleyway along Boogie Street. So one thing that was really interesting to me was the colour palette of the different stories. I mean, you have CHIJ, the orphanage, the nuns. I mean, that colour palette is it's a lot more muted, like greys and blacks and whites. Now contrast this with the colour palette of Boogies, the CD side of Boogies, with the Technicolor clothes, the big hair. I think now with costumes, characters and different stories and all the stuff that I've researched, it's finally time to put everything together. 
so I can tell a holistic story of Bras Basa and Bogus. The good, the bad, and the ugly. My version of Bras Basa and Bogus. The somber, dark stories of convicts. And yet, heartwarming moments of second chances, of lives saved, whether through a humble wooden shed or the sanctuary of a convent. The chaos of a prison break and the riot of colour of cabarets and seedy happenings. Oh my goodness. And it's all coming together. ready to reveal to the world what my version of Brass Pasa and Boogies looks like. I am Kunuk Mystery. <laughs>